All right. Well, thank you uh, for you know uh, sitting through the movie, and uh, I hope you enjoyed it. You know, I know I watched it uh, eight days before it was released, uh, you know, to the public, and uh, I remember I was a well of tears uh, the the whole time, and it was just such a powerful movie, one of the most powerful I've seen. And you know, we're so honored today to actually have an actress from the movie. We have uh, Sarah Hernandez uh, here. And, and uh, we also have Tracy from um, uh, Bold and the Beautiful Fame, and uh, also a lot of Christian films. So thank you for being with us today. And obviously, our good friend, Amanda yeah. Claus. Tracy was also on um, Do You Believe, which is also um, a film directed by the same gentleman who directed this film, Carrie Sullivan. Oh, wonderful. So, yeah, so she worked with Carrie as well. Great, so there's a connection, uh, uh, two degrees of separation with okay. Unplanned. Exactly. Yeah, how cool is that? Yeah, and you know our organization, we are very um, uh, supportive of Christian films and independent films. So, you know, we uh, we love that. You know that um, we had a movie here that went to number four, I guess, in the box office. Wow, that's pretty impressive for a Open Christian weekend film. Weekend too. Amazing, and you know that is that is not an easy feat by any means. So uh, congratulations to everyone involved in it. And um, I think a lot of you may know Annalia Anderson. Uh, Annalia, my very good friend and uh, ambassador of our organization and also um, just a key force in moving events like this forward. So you know, I really appreciate, and an actress in her own right. And uh, yes. yes. Not, not big time like them though. <laughs> <laughs> so we are honored to have some big timers here. So. Um, I actually want to just uh, maybe start um, start with Sarah, and then we can go down the line, and you can tell us a little bit about just uh, who you are, and you know maybe some key things. But don't go into your testimony yet. Oh dang! Okay, <laughs> just um, tell us a little bit about uh, who you are, where you're from, um, if you're local here in LA, and you know what kind of projects you're involved with right now. Um, hello, I'm Sarah Hernandez. Uh, a little bit about myself. I obviously I act. It's something I love to do. I'm from OC, so born and raised from Santa Ana, and I actually met Analia and her daughter at NRB, Sela, uh, literally the day we released the film, and so that's how this incredible connection happened. And they totally made me cry. So her story and Sela, they're so powerful. So when I see your daughter tonight, I was like, Oh, oh, Atlanta. Um, and just right now, projects I'm involved in, I actually have two faith-based films that I'm excited to be a part of that are uh, in the works right now. I just booked one two nights ago that I'm really excited about where I love acting because I love that God can use me to be just an advocate and someone to stand in the gap for so many things and to speak about. So my next movie I'm going to be working on, we're going to tackle suicide. So I'm really passionate about that um, and excited to use my gifts and talents for the What work. a timely topic, especially with the COVID lockdowns and the spike that we were just talking about that outside with some of our uh, great friends and volunteers outside, um, you know, in high school. There's a lot going on right now with high school students locked up and, you know, feeling no hope for the future. So thank you. I'm excited. So keep us posted. I know we'll be in touch because we'd love to promote that film. Thank Thanks. you. Wait, Tracy. Hi. Um, can you guys hear me? Okay. I actually live in Chino Hills, not far from here. Nice. Um, and I've been in LA as an actress I'm gonna date myself since 1991. I started in commercials. I was not a believer when I came out here. So I ran the course of everything you've heard of what not to do in Hollywood. Wrote a book about it. Um, back there, I actually wrote a book about how I broke all of God's Ten Commandments trying to be Hollywood's perfect ten. Um, and of course, the Thou Shall Not Kill was about my abortion. And I was 19 years old when I had my abortion. And, you know, she talked about the boyfriends in the movie, how they would leave. Well, mine decided not to pay for the um, antibiotic after. And I didn't know that. I didn't know I was supposed to take an antibiotic, but he didn't go to the pharmacy. He didn't want to pay for it. So I never got the antibiotic and I almost died. Um, I started having these really bad stuff. Oh, we're supposed to go into my test. Yeah, yeah. So tell us a little bit so, about what you're doing these I'm days. Not, I, my, I'm, I'm a better actress than student. Thank God. It's so hard but not to go into your testimony. Yeah. Yeah. So but, but real quick though, um, 
Bold and the Beautiful. I can yeah. tell you, my mom used to watch Bold and the Beautiful, so I do remember you. She stopped watching when I was off, right? Yeah. Probably, Probably, yeah. <laughs> but I, I believe you're still on, right? You're still like a recurring character that's supposed to live in Florida? Yeah, I went upstairs okay. and never came down, you know? <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, we live in Florida. My son's very active on the show. Um, not my real life son, my TV son. Um, so I still get talked about and everything and you know, come in once in a while. But yeah, I, I've had my longest career on The Bold and the Beautiful playing Kristen Forrester. Um, but I've done like Do You Believe and I did um, Hidden Secrets, other faith-based films with Pure Flix, Malibu Dan, and all those you know, little series. Um, and then most recently, <clears throat> I was in one of the final episodes of Criminal Minds. I did not survive that. Aww. <laughs> they, you off? they killed me off. Um, and then, uh, what else? Oh, games people play on BET. Um, we just finished that about a year on ago. BET, are you part black or? No. Okay. <laughs> no. <laughs> You never know these days, right? I know. So, you know. I actually, it was actually kind of a funny story because I walked into wardrobe and what they do is like the wardrobe people, they'll have tears of like, you know, ideas of what clothes they're going to dress each character in. And I walked in and it was a black woman and she had very short hair that was, I mean, she looked like the polar opposite of me. She was very like tough and gritty and, you know, all this. And I was like, hi, I'm here to play Roxanne. <laughs> and they're like, what? So it's kind of interesting. I don't know what happened there. I never got the backstory, but somehow I ended up getting cast in that role. But it was a lot of fun. Um, and then, what are you working on these days? Well, what I have coming out right now is a movie called The Runner, which is about drug overdose, which is a topic very close to my heart. I have um, been personally affected by that very close to us. Um, so that's coming out. Um, it's doing the film festivals right now and doing really well. And then I'm also producing a documentary on law enforcement. Uh, I would really like to do something to bridge the divide between the community and law enforcement. I am the wife and daughter of police officers, so. Thank you. Thank you for being a frontliner or being a, a spouse of a frontliner. Thank you. Yeah, really appreciate that. And both timely topics. I mean, we got the suicide issue. We got the law enforcement, which is a big debate out there. So yeah, very timely, timely films. I'm excited. So once again, let me know. Keep, keep in touch with me so we can promote your film. Uh, Analia, tell us a little bit about yourself. Okay, my background, I started out pursuing music, and while I was doing that, I got into, uh, I was pursuing acting and modeling. I started about 1995, enjoyed Saturn when I was like 96, um, did a couple commercials, but then, um, yeah, I was still pursuing music, but then God pushed me into film, um, and I got married after I went to film school, and then had my daughter, and then I've just been working on my own film. It's called For Such a Time as This. It's against, you know, attack on the church and what's going on today. And then, um, yeah, and then got involved with uh, Mark, and I want to help him tell his story. And now I'm finding out I'm I want to help her tell her story. So, <laughs> so yeah. So. so very exciting, yeah. And let's get right into it now. Um, you know, maybe we can uh, start with Anna Leah, you know, come back down this way. And tell us a little more, bit more about your testimony because you know I've heard it before. We've done this screening several times, once in Orange Coast College and once once in a church in uh, Orange. And uh, Analia was there for the, the college one, one. Yeah. yeah, and definitely it was very powerful. So you'll want to hear this, Analia. Yes. Yeah, so um, my first high, uh, my first boyfriend was my high school college boyfriend, and I got pregnant twice had two abortions, one right after the other, and at that point, I mean, I grew up Catholic, but at that point I knew God was getting my attention. And he's basically saying, you know, you can't expect to get a different result doing the same thing, you know, and it just gets worse. So at that point I started seeking God, and um, when you're Catholic, like in the church, they have the little missalettes, and they have like the, um, a reading of Psalms and Proverbs every day. So I started, I'd go to church every day, and just, you know, before I went to work or whatever, and I would just like open up the missalette, and I would read the Psalms and Proverbs. And um, I remember reading about King Solomon, and he always asked God for wisdom instead of just asking for wealth when God asked him, you know, what would you like? And he wanted wisdom to rule his people. And I thought, gosh, you know, like, that's what I want, you know, I want wisdom because I keep on making bad choices. And so, so God, you know, he opened my eyes and he showed me why I was making poor choices. And when you don't have a close family unit and you're not close to your father, um, especially in your teens when you're kind of exploring your sexual identity, um, you seek love outside the home. And then a lot of, 
especially girls who don't, you know, have a close, you know, father figure, you know, they they give themselves away, and that's what I did. And so, and it took a while, but you know, like it took a couple years before I, like God really showed me who I was in Christ. And once you know that, you know your worth. And after that, I just started pursuing God. Um, and it was a few years later that um, I pulled up to church and there was a sign that had a service for people who had abortions and it was like a healing service. And um, I had kind of put that experience behind me. So, uh, you know, I, it didn't really affect me. And all of a sudden, like, I just felt really convicted. Um, and then I just wanted, you know, and I knew God loved me and forgave me. So I just, you know, that's really when I surrendered my life to him. I said, I just, Jesus, I just want to know who you are. At that point, I felt a tingling sensation through my body. And then, yeah, it was just full speed ahead. And I didn't realize the impact. Uh, even though God forgives us, we still face the consequences in the natural. And it wasn't until after I had my daughter, I got married, had her, had no issues with her. But after that, I had five miscarriages. Um, and so, at like, by the third one, I was mad at God. And I'm like, okay, you know, um, um, yeah, I was upset. I'm like, you know, why, why are you doing this? And then he, he, he showed me my sin. I'm like, okay, if I can't have another child, I'm okay with it. But just allow me to be a voice for you. And so um, I've helped other friends who were considering um, having abortions to keep their babies. Um, and one friend, she's got five beautiful children. She's not married. We're, we're, we're working on her marrying her boyfriend. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, so, and another friend, you know, she got married and had a child. She, she didn't want kids, but she has a beautiful boy now. So now I, you know, try to help others. And the other thing is, is men, because we always think it's always about the woman having a, an abortion. And I've met more men who've had them and never really dealt with that too. So part of the healing process is allowing men to grieve and, and to repent and be forgiven as well. Yeah, we had a powerful moment, I think, in Orange. Uh, you know, we had a line of uh, yeah, men people came up. questioning. Yeah. And then that one, um, he was a young man, yeah. probably, like, in his 20s. Yeah. And he just broke down in tears. He was yeah. just really shaken up by the whole, you know, because um, there was no communication, remember, between him and his uh, girlfriend who was pregnant. And there was this assumption yeah. on her end, because, I mean, we have a prevailing society that just says it's a burden, so yeah. just get rid of it, right? Yeah. And he wasn't consulted in that. Yeah. And she assumed yeah. that he would have raised the baby. Yeah. So that was a very powerful moment that we experienced, and it just, like, you know, really moved me. So thanks for bringing that yeah. up. I think there really needs to be ministry around that. There, so. um, I actually have a friend in Nashville. She's part of a ministry that helps men heal. Oh, wonderful. Yeah. So, yeah, amazing. So. Great. Thanks for sharing, Analia. Tracy, I know you started getting into your story, but yeah, let's pick up from from where you left off and uh, tell us tell us more and more more details on that. You know, nineteen year old coming to L.A. Right? Um, yeah. She yeah. Was a cliffhanger. Yeah, I know. Right? <laughs> to be continued. Um, yeah, I just want to pick up on what you said real quick though about men, and I think that's awesome, and I'm so glad you brought it up because it wasn't lost on me when you introduced yourself and you talked about. You said, I had two abortions, and I've never heard a man say that, and that struck me, and then so I was glad to have this chance to, you know, um, praise you for that, because that is something that should be brought up more, and I agree with that, and that's something I could get behind, is helping more men, because when I, I was talking about my book a little bit, um, when my book came out, I originally thought I wrote it for girls who was similar to her, you know, didn't have the father figure in my life growing up. And, you know, you just want that male attention. You suddenly trade it for that's when you, you know, get their attention is in this, this promiscuous way, unfortunately. But I always thought my book was written mostly for women, but I got so many men that came up and were like, you know, I struggle with these things, too, about my self-worth and, and everything. So it's um, a beautiful thing. But um, I can't remember where I was. The blonde. You can start from the beginning. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, all right. So, I was I. I grew up in Colorado. We moved a lot. We were. It was just like such a interesting childhood. I lived with my grandparents for five years. When my parents got divorced, I didn't see my mom for such a long period of time that I didn't even recognize her when she walked in it um, after a long enough period of time. I didn't see my dad for 10 years. Um, and so I just had a lot of abandonment issues and self-worth issues. And um, my parents, or my mom, moved us halfway through seventh grade. 
which is, you know, like, oh my gosh, the worst time ever, right? So I had to go to a new school halfway through seventh grade, and all the elective classes were full, except acting. <laughs> yeah. I was like, God really hates me, because I'm like, it's a new school, and I have to go to acting. So that's how I got into acting, I, and I ended up, here I am now, making, I made a career out of it. What seemed like, and that was the first lesson, that sometimes what seems like a curse or bad thing is a blessing. And I think about, you know, even pregnancies, you know, it seems like, oh my gosh, it's the worst thing ever, it's the worst thing me. And it turns into, you know, just to go with it and trust, you know, God's plan. But anyway, so um, I ended up in this terrible relationship with this guy and ended up pregnant. And, you know, I struggled with the decision and ultimately decided to get an abortion. And I was able to justify it because he was a bodybuilder, so he was on testosterone. And I was like, there's my, I'm always looking for the loophole, right? Always looking for the loophole. It's like, oh yeah, there's a chance it could have birth defects. I'm, I just, I, I really, I just ought to, you know, it's probably the better thing. So I felt very, you know, like I was doing a noble thing and justified doing it. Wow. And... I had to pay for it myself, just like her, because he's like, I just really don't have the cash for that right now. And so I paid for it myself. And again, he took me and then picked me up. And he's the one who got that little whatever information after. And I found out a few days ago, or a few days later, I was in just so much pain, so much abdominal pain. And to the point where I was like punching the wall in the bed during the night. And he's like, ah, I have to sleep in the morning. And I was like, okay, I'll go on the couch. I had such low self-esteem and no self-worth at all. So I went and slept on the, um, in the living room on the couch. The next morning I called my mom. I'm like, mom, I just really feel sick. I don't feel right. She's like, I'm on my way. I'll bring you Taco Bell. Because anybody who knew me, I'd love Taco Bell. <laughs> <laughs> and so she shows up with a bean burrito. And when I wouldn't eat my bean burrito supreme, she's like, we're calling the doctor. <laughs> Something's wrong. And so she called the doctor and explained my symptoms. He said, meet me at the emergency room. And so I met him there, takes me in, and he goes, we need you to sign these forms before we take you in. There is a really good chance we're going to have to remove all your reproductive organs. The infection is so bad and it is spread throughout. And I was like, oh, oh my gosh. I had, this was my one chance to ever have a child and I, really blew it. God's punishing me. And so, of course, I signed the form because they said if I didn't, that I could potentially die of peritonitis, which is a really bad internal bacterial infection. And um, so I went in and I woke up and my stomach was very descended. I felt awful. And as I came to the nurse, I asked her, I said, so they take everything? And, and she goes, no. She goes, no. I got lucky. She said God was God blessed you, she said. Um, it was really a miracle. And, and I said, no, God hates me. She goes, no, hon, God forgave you. You just need to forgive yourself. And I was like, okay. You know, I was, wasn't a believer then, and but I remembered it. It stuck with me. Um, and so after that, I left the boyfriend, came to Hollywood, and I was like, all right, you know, success is the best revenge, right? So I'm just gonna go be a big star. And so I came out here you know, trails blazing, and it was, I got caught up in the casting couch scene, everything, I was willing to do what it took um, to succeed out here, and um, and I had some success, I was doing well, I was doing a lot of commercials, guest starring on, you know, shows or whatever, um, but, and I got married at 22, because again, I was looking for that security and that stability and that foundation, and honestly, I married my first husband because I really liked his parents. <laughs> I wanted her to be my mom. Sue was cool. So that was part of it. And anyway, so that marriage ended with um, him going to um, jail for a felony for domestic violence. Um, and I ended up divorced. And sometimes you don't turn to God till God's all you got. And so that divorce was like 26 years of abandonment were just pouring out of me. Because actually, the irony is after he went to jail for domestic abuse, by the way, I was still like, it's okay, it's all good, we're good. I know you weren't, you know. And I, he's the one who divorced me. Because he had a felony, and he was mad at me about that. And I was still like trying to get him to forgive me after that. 
That's how bad my self-esteem was. I was literally modeling swimwear and lingerie and had that low of self-esteem. Um, anyway, so that ended up in divorce and I started going to my therapist named Dr. Doctor, real name, that's why I picked him, because you know, when you're looking for a doctor and the doctor, doctor, I'm like, give me the news, right? <laughs> so I went to Dr. Doctor and he was like, he was so mean, he was so mean, but I needed mean. He's like, he, he just told me how it was and what I needed to hear. And this secular doctor told me, I have no foundation to build on with you. And he sent me out church shopping. Wow. He goes, you need, you need some faith. You need something. He goes, I have nothing to build on with you. You have no background, no stability, no foundation. And um, a couple of these cute little, like, bright-eyed, bushy-tailed, fresh-off-the-farm kids showed up in my acting class. I was a work-study student, and they were both Christians, and I became friends with them, and I was telling them the story earlier. And I think what really spoke to me was it was never... She didn't lead with, do you believe, or you should believe, or this is why you should believe. She introduced me to Jesus first. Amen. And she just got, like, started telling me about this friend of hers that had this best advice, you know, and to reference and to seek him. And, and she was amazing. And, you know, we can't give her all the credit because I think it was, was it Billy Graham who said it takes 40 people to lead you to Christ. Right. The first one thinks they did nothing, the last one thinks they did everything, and they're both wrong. <laughs> so we don't want to give Chris all the credit, but she was the one at the end. Um, and so I started pointing my feet towards God, and I was a serial dater, and Dr. Doctor said, Tracy, you got to just not date for a while. Then I went country dancing, because redneck country girl from Colorado, went country dancing, and then Rob walked in. I was like, Dr. Doctor, the, I'm, he's, but, but, but. So anyway, Dr. Doctor had to approve my now husband. I've been married 22 years. <laughs> he got, Dr. Doctor approved of him. And, um, you know, we both became believers together. And um, we have two sons, and I will never forget the first one, my first son, when he came home and I was sitting in the you know, little glider rocking chair. And out the window, there, you know, it was just a beautiful starry night, bright starry night. And I remember holding this child and I looked up to the heavens and I thanked God and I said, this is grace, this is mercy. And so um, I'm very grateful for all of the people along the way from the nurse who said it, you know, right after my abortion to my friend Chris, to all the people along the way who just, you know, helped me point my feet to that, that mercy and to have two healthy pregnancies after that. and. Um, it really takes a village mm -hmm. and you know I'm so glad you're saved and you're here to share this story with us thank you thank you Tracy and she's fine. <laughs> of course that was my coping mechanism yes. <laughs> Sarah wow um, you know I gotta be real with you guys I, the movie was playing I walked in towards the end and I, I have my mom here with me I bring my mom with me everywhere um, hi mom um, good job mom that woman took me to like every audition every acting class has believed in me since I wasn't even here yet um, and so I'm so thankful but this time three years ago we filmed this movie and it just blows my mind like right now we would literally be filming in Oklahoma um, and it's also been exactly two years since we released the film. And I knew that when I said yes to this movie that God really put on my heart that this would be a movie that would follow me for the rest of my life. That it wasn't something like a normal acting job that we do, we go, we film, boom, we move on with our lives, it airs on TV, on to the next thing. This was something for me completely different. Um, my story is I started acting from a very young age, I was 14, and I knew from the time I was, I don't know, I was always that weird kid that was like telling stories and just, you know, they were lies. But like, oh my gosh, I saw a bear in the backyard. I live in Santa Ana. There are no <laughs> bears in Santa Ana. I just had this wild imagination and I was always pretending, you know, I'd watch Lion King and then pretend I was a lion and roar at my family. I was just always into pretending and I love storytelling. And so naturally when I was 14, and given an option of either having a sweet 16 or, you know, my, my parents wanted to throw me a, a birthday, a big birthday bash. And I remember asking my dad, 
how much is that going to cost you? Mind you, I was 14 at the time. And my dad was like, wait, what? You want to know what it's going to cost? And I was like, yeah. And he's like, why? And I said, I just want to know what it's going to cost you. He said, okay, 10 grand. And I was like, wow, $10,000 for one day. He said, yeah. And I was like, can I save you $1,000, dad? And I asked my parents to send me to acting school instead. And thankfully, you know, you get scammed a lot as kids. You gotta be really careful with acting. People approach you at the mall, be very careful. But for me, it actually worked out. Um, I ended up getting <laughs> discovered by a Disney Channel casting director, the same woman who discovered Shia LaBeouf and cast, casted a bunch of Disney Channel shows, um, discovered me and took me under her wing and became my first acting coach, found me my first agent, my manager, gave me my first line in a movie. and. Um, I was very, very privileged and very blessed in my early career. Um, worked on shows like Secret Life of the American Teenager, uh, The Mentalist, and just had some awesome success in my early career. But the one thing that I did not have was Jesus. And to the world, it looked like I had everything. On the outside, on social media, on Facebook, you'd see me with this famous person, hanging out with this person, doing singing karaoke with so-and-so, and people were just like, wow, you have the life, but little did they know, I would go home and cry every single night because I didn't know where I was gonna go when I died. And for me, and I think every actor can relate to this, is a lot of times people, we're empty. Without Christ, we are empty. And so we're seeking purpose, we're seeking meaning, we're seeking, to be something, to be some, to become something because we feel like we're nothing. But with Christ, we have everything, right? So here I was at 21, just completely depressed, not knowing where I was gonna go when I was gonna die. And thank God my mom, uh, I mean, I'm so sorry, mom, for how many times I ruined your worship time by making you late for church or just like, oh, I don't want to go. But something for me, I was hung, God was calling me at 21. And I loved acting with every fiber of my being. It was honestly my God before Christ came into my life. Um, but at 21, I surrendered my life to Jesus and I wanted to follow his will for my life. And everyone thought I was nuts because I had just finished working on a show with Tyler Perry called um, Secret Life of the American Teenager. And uh, it was a comedic role. He loved my work and wanted to write me into the show, but I was just a brand new Christian and I felt like the Lord was telling me no. Wow. And for a year, I wrestled with God. And my mom is my witness here. I, I just. I wrestled because I loved acting so much. I knew from a young age that was what I was born to do. I was born to pretend and to tell stories. Um, but God, here was God calling me to go in a completely different direction that didn't make any sense to me. But I knew it was the right thing to do to surrender. And so I, that's what I did at 21. I surrendered my acting career to Christ. I went cold turkey for Christ is what I like to call it. <laughs> and uh, decided to leave everything behind, all my success. Um, everyone thought I was nuts. And it was the best decision I ever made because that led me into the wonderful world of retail. <laughs> because I was that person that did not go to college because I told my high school counselor, I'm gonna be an actor and I'm gonna make it. And I did, and I went back and told him. And then Jesus is like, no, go the other way. And I'm like, okay, Lord. So that led me into retail, which, and put me in a tiny little Christian bookstore out here in Orange County, which was called Family Christian. Do y'all remember that store? So I ended up working at a family Christian bookstores and I ended up being there for seven years and I managed and it was during my time there that- Did you, did you sell Tracy's books? Yeah, I did. Oh, did. I watched Do You Believe, I did. So here's the crazy part. So I'm here I am with all this like Hollywood experience in this tiny little Christian bookstore. I mean, Tyler Perry wanted to write me into a show and I'm like, Lord Jesus, what are you doing? I started watching faith-based films and I'm gonna be very brutally honest. Go ahead, yep, you already know. They were bad. And I was like, literally, Lord, what are you doing? I'm Hollywood trained. Are you kidding me, Jesus? Like, okay, I do not, do you guys hear all that pride, how terrible? No wonder God made me wait seven years, right? He, he, what does he do? He gives grace to the humble. So thank you, Jesus, for not doing things in my time. But it turned into seven years of me working there, and I started watching these movies, and I just remember watching two that really stuck out to me. Do You Believe stuck out to me, but that's because there's great writing. Chuck Konzelman and Carrie Solomon are incredible writers. Um, and you can recognize that in their movies. But I watched War Room, and that stuck out to me. And then I watched a little movie called God's Not Dead. And I was like, 
okay, there's something here. Like, whoa, <laughs> Jesus, I don't get it. Like, I have all this training. I have all this experience. I gave my life to you. Why didn't you let me go and be a part? It's going to make me cry every time I tell the story. Why didn't you let me stay in Hollywood? Because I wanted to be there and pursue, like maybe get found by these guys and do Christian films, Lord. I can honor you with this. But God's plan and his timing is so perfect. Never rush, you, you can never rush the timing of God. But I remember one day I was standing in my Christian bookstore and it was in between, uh, I was by myself, I was waiting for the next closers, closing staff to come in. And I, I went over to the movie section and I grabbed these two films. I grabbed War Room and God's Not Dead and I flipped over on the back and I started reading the names on the back. I was like, I wanna know who wrote this, who directed it, who produced it. I wanna know who these men are. Read their names and I just remember thinking to myself, wow, Lord, I, I have this desire to act, but I know you told me no. And I'm, I'm still surrendered to you, Lord. Not my will, your will be done, but God, I'm presenting my desire to you. I wanna get back into the industry, I wanna act again. But I, this time I want to honor you with it and not myself. But Lord, I want to work with these men. The men that made these movies, this is who I want to work with, Jesus. I don't have an agent. I don't have a manager. But I have you. And with God, nothing is impossible. Amen. So God, if it's your will, open the doors. I want to work with these men. So I'm just, in Jesus' name, amen. I prayed over these movies. Two years later, I kid you not, the, the desire to act was still there. Even though I was yielded to God out of Hollywood, trusting him. And it just never left me, this desire to hop back into acting. And once you're an actor, it's kind of like you're always an actor. You're like, dang it, I can't ever, I can't escape it. It is, it's super fun. And one day I had some friends call me from Atlanta. Uh, I serve every year if I can at a faith-based foster ranch. And this uh, couple called and just offered to pray over me. And I just remember telling them, I don't think I need prayer for anything. Oh, wait, um, I, I actually need an answer from God. I, I'm praying to him, wondering if I'm supposed to go back into Hollywood, but I don't know what that looks like if I should go faith-based. I mean, I really would love to work with faith-based, but I now know the Kendrick brothers are working with Sony. So does that mean I need a secular agent to try to get involved? I just, I don't know what to do. I just need God's direction. Can you pray for me? And I'm having a hard time also understanding how God can send me back somewhere he clearly took me out of. And they, I remember them ministering to me and them telling me, well, Sarah, what about Moses? And I was like, well, what about him? And they were like, well, you know, he was a son of Pharaoh, he was in Egypt, and then he chose to suffer with his people and left, and then, you know, the whole burning bush thing, Sarah? Yeah, God called him, put that desire, sent him back, this time though to do his will, God's will, and I was like, huh. Okay, that's wonderful. You're not God, so love you. But can you just pray that God would give me like a clear answer? They were like, okay, we'll pray for you. <laughs> you guys, two days later, I walked into Family Christian Bookstore, and I found out through Facebook, mind you. I was opening the store like a normal day, opening registers, and I opened my Facebook to check some notifications, and I seen someone post an article from MSNBC letting me know that the entire company closed down, and I lost my job two days after my friends prayed for me. And I cannot begin to tell you how happy I was. Because I knew that God clearly answered, like, okay, this is something I'm meant to do. I feel really bad that 2,000 people lost their job because I needed an answer from God. But, you know, God, right, never lets the righteous back for bread, so they're all fine, everyone's fine. Um, and that began my journey back into acting. And within less than six months, I, I ended up meeting someone um, one of my customers actually turned out to be a faith-based actress, and I ended up sharing my whole story with her, my testimony, and she was like, I have to help you. Um, I sold her movies on my shelf, too. And uh, small world, OC world, super small. Um, I actually go to church in Chino Hills, by the way, so we're gonna talk. Yeah, PJ's my pastor. Do you go to Chino Hills? <gasps> what? Sorry, moment. Um, but one of these- new best friend. <laughs> Wait, okay, moment, we're gonna talk. Um, we go to the same church and we don't even know it. It's so big. It's a big one. It's a big church. Mm -hmm. So this faith-based actress ended up helping me. I went to volunteer on her short film set. Her line producer, um, someone who worked on her film, knows Chuck and Carrie, the writers of God, uh, Do You Believe God's Not Dead. Uh, they also wrote Woodlawn. And you guys, these are the people I literally prayed to work with. She and I became friends. Six months later, she randomly gives me a call. She's... I just, I'll never forget it. My phone rings, I picked it up, and she's like, hey, 
Uh, I have some friends who are casting a movie. I can't tell you what the movie is. It's really hush hush, but I can tell you who's making it. And I just remember asking her, okay, well, who's making it? She goes, have you seen God's Not Dead? I literally dropped my phone. Wow. Because I didn't have an agent. I didn't have a manager. I was fresh back into acting and just God made that way for me. Wow. I was blown away that they would even get to see my audition. I didn't even audition for this movie, guys. It was a straight offer. Having, I mean, and you get it. Having not worked for seven years to have a straight offer, that's, that's God. Impossible. That's yeah. impossible. But God, yep. it's, like, it's, like, it's not normal. I'm the only actor in the film that did an audition. Wow. It was a straight offer. Um, God didn't put me through the torture because auditioning is not fun. Yeah, no, it's the worst part. Um, but I'll never forget it. I just remember thanking the Lord even in that moment just praising him just for where he brought me. And then if he took me to the next step, I was still gonna praise him. But I just remember thanking him for even the opportunity for these men to see my work and to know who I am. Did not expect them to offer me a role in this movie. And they grilled me, trust me. They grilled every actor. They needed us to know that being in a movie like this is a, is a career breaker in Hollywood. Associating yourself with a movie about abortion is you're blacklisting yourself. Oh, yeah. But I just remember every time they came at me with like, okay, you're gonna go in a supermarket and someone might hate you. They may have seen the movie and then they'll, they'll cuss you out. Okay, I gave up my career once for Jesus and like literally I prayed to work with you. So to say no to you is literally <laughs> say no to God and that'd be really silly. So I, you, I, I would scoop up poop Easy, on your yes. set. It's like, you're not gonna talk me out of it. I have to do it. I don't care if like it costs me my life. Like I'm gonna go to heaven. I know where I'm going, so I have to do it. And it's been the most, not only to have a physical manifestation of God answering my prayer, but then being able to speak up on behalf of life. I never thought in a million years I would have the honor and the privilege of doing something I love, but then being able to be an advocate, to speak up on behalf of life. And myself, I've, I've never been through an abortion, and, and I don't know that pain, but I do know God. And I know that he allowed me to be a part of this film for such a time as this. He took me out of Hollywood, he separated me, and that's what he does. He sanctified me and set apart my talent, my gifts. He's like, no, Tyler Perry, uh-uh. We're not, we're not, love you, Tyler. We're not doing that. I have a calling for you. I have a purpose for you. And I couldn't see it. But some of our biggest, what did you said it, like are things that look like not. What we think is the bad thing. Yeah. It turns into a good thing. So sacrificing and giving up my career, it was the most incredible decision I ever made. And it led me, I had never in a million years would think that Jesus would bring me back, let alone lead me to the very man that I prayed to work with and get to speak up on behalf of life. Like God does things bigger and better than our plans and imaginations can ever try. So yeah, that's my story. What a powerful story. Now I want to transition because we have some experts really in the field here. You know, I, I have always been a believer that um, film is an important medium to get to, especially young people. I think we always want to, uh, you know, establish a good foundation and, you know, a movie like and planned really, uh, you know, impacts people. Like I brought a lot of uh, younger college students to see the, the initial premiere uh, before the movie was released. And it was amazing because I actually had one of the um, 18 year olds come to me and say thank you so much for bringing me to this movie because I have never heard of a pro-life perspective. Mm -hmm. And that was shocking to me because in California, especially in this very secular world we live in, Hollywood's right here, it's almost like, you know, the moment you say Christian, things shut. Yes, and then nothing gets processed and the, our, our messages, our wisdom, our truth do not get disseminated. Now, I think Christian film, I totally agree with you, and uh, Annalie and I have chatted about We're working this. on it. Like, it's looking like, you know, bad Hallmark movies, or worse, you know, I think the soap operas are even better, actually. <laughs> they have be better storylines a lot of times, you know? I mean, I, I love, <laughs> I, I like it when characters disappear, come back from the dead, you know, have amnesia, you know, I mean, soap operas are really funny. <laughs> but, no, I'm also thinking of becoming a uh, Christian acting coach, so it'd be really fun. Yes. But where do you see uh, Christian film? 
like um, you know where it is now and what we can do as a community, what we can do as uh, you know. Uh, connoisseurs and consumers of uh, Christian film and being in the Christian community to help the genre mature. And maybe let's start. Let's start with Tracy. Yeah, go Tracy. I think we have to stop calling them Christian films. I think we just have to make films that honor God. And I think that sometimes we pigeonhole them like that, right? Yeah. And then it becomes us preaching to the choir, because now it's a Christian film, so people who aren't Christian are gonna think that it's not for them, right? Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, like one of my favorite Christian films, because I'm funny, um, Bruce Almighty. <laughs> right? That is a good Christian film. It's, it is biblically sound, right? <laughs> it's Jim Carrey. It's Jim, yeah, but right? If you, I mean, watch you know, that the sometime. lesson too. Actually, is really incredible, yes, though. Right in when film. he's like, "I just want to see her through your eyes." It's like not playing God. He had all that arrogance we talk about. I mean, it wasn't a Christian film, and I think that that's where we need to go: is not pigeonhole ourselves into that, right? I, I think that's call, a good go part. far. Just call like the Avengers a Christian film, <laughs> <laughs> because when you really think about it, there's a bad guy, right? We all know who that is, Satan. Mm -hmm. Then you, you ever it's like if you watch every film, especially certain genres, there's like it's the same storyline. There's a bad guy. We need the hero. We need saving. Help me! Like you know, it's it's the same thing over and over. Like you could look at Thanos yeah. and consider him a Satan, and then you can look at the Avengers. Like that's what Jesus did. Like have you seen those superhero yeah. shirts where there's all the heroes and then Jesus is in there? Like look what I did. We need more of that. Yeah, and I think if we can make just good films, you know. And but still, Christians making films, not people making Christian films. Like Christians just making films and honoring God yeah. with their gifts and talents. I, that's my thing. I do. I am grateful that the budgeting has gotten better. I think that has helped a lot um, with success of the Passion of the Christ. That was a huge shift right. in being able to fund faith-based films more. Um, you know, people like, you know, companies like PureFlix that were able to have success with God's yeah. Not Dead and then they could have more funding and, you know, even though we got less funding on Do You Believe, and, but that's okay. I'm not bitter. Uh, <laughs> that's a huge thing, though. It really does matter. Um, I recently got really interested in the producing side of things as well, and it, take, it takes a village um, to get a movie done. It's not just about the actor. That's what I'm learning. I love working behind the scenes. I love doing craft services and serving people food um, and just learning that there's so much more to filmmaking than just the actors behind the scenes. I think I agree with funding. Um, if you are financially blessed and you are passionate about certain stories, consider investing in a film too. That that would be money does make a difference. Um, I don't know. Are we and supporting them. Yes. Yeah. And also going a lot of people talking. aren't you know, there's some good faith based films out. Um, and no one shows up, you know, they, they don't get, you know, they're like, yeah, we've got, oh, we've got a limited release this, you know, weekend, 200 theaters, if it goes well, we'll go another weekend, and they don't get enough people showing up and buying tickets, and we really just need to rally behind and support. And I think that's what we did with Unplanned. I know there was a very organic, but also a very purposeful marketing push around it. Can you tell us a little more about that, Sarah? Yeah. There was literally no way no marketing we we were rejected by hallmark food i believe it was food network yeah. um they wouldn't take their uh, um, ad money would not run ads yeah. we offered me legit money was like there resistance because it was rated r though well, um, no no, they, okay. no actually the r rating was really helpful um okay. we were hoping for a pg-13 rating because That's in right california it's illegal for a 12 year old to walk into planned parenthood and have an abortion but it's illegal for an eight uh child under 18 to go watch our film about Planned Parenthood. So we're like, yes, give us that R rating. We're going to ride that. So um, we really, with the motion pictures of America, we were like, oh, so you agree. Abortion is a violent act. There's a lot of blood and gore. Right. So it's, it's it, you agree with us. But um, yeah, we had a lot of pushback um, with uh, running ads. We weren't able to really run. And you didn't see any commercials for it, right? But yet we still made $20 million in America. Because people that was profit, want, right? Straight yep. profit. I mean. Straight profit. So it just and then we officially released the film in over a hundred countries, as far as I know, probably <coughs> maybe about hundred and fifty countries across 
uh, the world. So it's, it's been incredible. Um, but yeah, it was really difficult. It's really hard um, to promote a film. About so actually, I think that, that probably was the community coming together. Because I guess I'm very involved in the community. So for me, Unplanned was everywhere. You know, it was like I couldn't escape it. There were still, in the Christian community, people knew about it and were pushing it. But there were still people that I knew that had never even heard of the film. So people who rely on, like, the media for their information and because they, like, the liberal media wouldn't take their advertising money. Um, mm -hmm. So they didn't get that kind of, um, yeah, uh, advertising. Yeah. So, but it was all, like, just the Christian community pushing it out there and supporting it. Like, even college campuses, like, inviting their friends. I know Students for Life was big on inviting yes. so many college students and, um, like yes. Yeah. So it was incredible to see everyone kind of rally. What really helped us, too, was a lot of churches doing theater buyouts. Yeah. So churches uh, bought out theaters and, and either sold tickets to their congregation or just invited people to come watch the film, so that was really helpful. Um, but it still did, it had an incredible yeah. run. I think America was shocked that we were in theaters as long as we were. Right. So they didn't yeah, how many weeks was it on uh, a good two months? Of course, right? Yeah, I was gonna say it was over six well, yeah. weeks, eight yeah. weeks. Yeah, I was, I was very surprised. And uh, you know, $20 million profit and it was everywhere. It got out there. And when we did it in Orange Coast College, soon after you know, its theatrical run, uh, you know, we got press coverage yeah. on it too. Of course it was negative, they were, you know, they call it a disputed film. <laughs> I love that, you know, as, as if someone's uh, personal experiences can be disputed, right? Yeah. Yeah, but that's what they, they do, um, the people that, you know, um, are against Christians, and it's very sad. But, you know, it was it's amazing because I think this should be the model, right, for future Christian films that are very solid, very well filmed, well edited, um, and, and powerful like this one. We should definitely, as a community, get behind it, get key influencers like they did. Because remember, I got to see it like eight days before, and it was uh, getting it was getting people like me that you know are involved in the community to see it and then become like the biggest cheerleaders. And for me, it was so easy because the movie was so good that when I left after watching it, I was like, I gotta tell the world. And Can I just um, say, I think that's what really helped God's Not Dead. They had this genius social media marketing campaign at the end of it with hashtag mm -hmm. God's Not Dead to all your friends. I was like, what? Oh, yes, he's not. I'm like, what? Okay, Donna, that was random. You know, but it was, then it started that conversation and they got to promote, it was genius. And that film did very well also. I think they were like 90 million or so, wasn't it crazy? So it's like, there's things we can do like like that that need to be done. Hashtags, you know, social media. Because even if social media will not let you boost something, which I know with controversial content, they're always blocking my posts for not going with community standards, whatever that means. But, you know, there's ways around it. Because if you have a big uh, organic community, you can still put it out to your community on Facebook and Twitter without that banning. So, you know. May I say one more thing? The biggest thing you can help, and this should not sound cheesy, this is like a call for support. Pray. Amen. Um, I can't tell you, we had on the set of Unplanned, we had a prayer team every day. Um, when we were literally shooting scenes, there are like behind the scenes photos of hands all over the set. Oh, it just, it gives me chills. When we were filming pivotal scenes, it just, the prayer affected so much. Like. Yes, I went through warfare on set a couple of days, but I was able to turn and go to someone like, I need prayer right now. Mm -hmm. And to know that we had literally thousands of people just praying over our set, it just was incredible. So if you can add to your prayer time, there, <laughs> I'm telling you now. Not cheesy. Not cheesy. Not cheesy. We need prayer because prayer is the most powerful weapon. You know, we're, we're telling, we're. We're telling stories that are gonna impact people for eternity. Passion of the Christ, I literally got to meet Jim Caviezel and tell him to his face to thank him. Like actor to actor, performer to performer, like very rarely do we get to meet people that just impact us, but like he impacted me for eternity. That's that flogging scene, yeah. it affected me for life. I can never get it out of my mind. And his choice to play Christ, he didn't work in Hollywood for two years, he told me. And I he said, but the fact that it like affected you, you were worth it for me. So it's, 
we're telling stories that are gonna impact people for eternity. This movie's gonna impact a woman who's watching or a man who's watching and he's gonna call that girlfriend and go, hey, I changed my mind. We're gonna do this. It's We're, in, we're impacting people. So prayer is so important. And I'm telling you guys, there's so many good Christian movies that are gonna come out. You don't even know. Let's yeah. pray. So, so the genre is maturing is what you're saying. Oh, we're we're stepping away from the, from the cheesy, um, you know, low budge to the... We're telling yeah. real life okay. stories. I know yeah. Chuck, yeah. Chuck, that's, that's, that's the thing. Um, Cause I go to a lot of the Christian conferences and, and what I'm seeing um, the trend is, is uh, for the, the filmmakers is they want to tell real life stories. And, and in a way, and, and I get that because when we share our own testimony, um, the haters and the naysayers, they can't refute that because it's our, it's our story. Where they might like, question, oh, well, the Bible was written like 2,000 years ago, and it's just, you know, a bunch of people writing these, you know. So they don't, they can try to negate that, right. uh, they but they do. can't negate your own personal story. So real testimonies are so powerful and effective, and that's the trend I see that the, the bigger, you know, studios and filmmakers, they want to tell real stories. You know, and, and every we all have a story. You know, yeah. we all have a story. And so... You know, um, God's purpose is for you to tell the story, and no matter how you do it, whether it's in a book or in a song or however, God has your story written, and um, ask Him, how, you know, to show you how to share that story because your story is so powerful that um, it changes lives. So, so, so yeah. I'm so glad you said that because I, at the risk of sounding like I'm name dropping, because I, I find ways to bring this up because it's a feather in my cap. But I got to go on Larry King when my book came out. <laughs> And I remember being so freaking nervous. I'm like, oh my gosh, I was a new Christian. I just wrote my testimony book. And you know, the call comes in that the Larry King show wants to interview you. And I was really nervous. And my friend, Chris, who uh, was in my acting class and introduced me to Jesus, I was like, I, I, I'm really nervous. What if I say something wrong, something dumb? And, and, um, and she's like, well, he's not, this isn't a theology class, and you're not uh, getting, he's, just, he's no theologian, but he's going to be quizzing you on scripture, and she said, it's about your story, and your story can't be kind of like what you just said, it's like, no one can argue about your story, and I basically just opened my mouth and let Jesus come out, you know, and it, it just ended up being this amazing interview, and it wasn't like that, and it was, um, and I think sometimes we have to remember that God doesn't call the qualified, he qualifies the called. And, I, and she reminded me of that. She's like, you're being called to go on and talk about faith for an hour. Don't worry about, oh, I'm not qualified, I can't do it. And so I just thought that was an appropriate story. And I think that that's the, the beautiful thing now because uh, we've had years and years of material from Hollywood that basically recycles that same story that we, we had talked about earlier. And now people want to hear the real gritty stuff, the real, you know, and it's not always so happy and, you know, you tie up it in a bow and say, oh, this is a beautiful thing. No, it's uh, sometimes there's a lot of sadness and pain like we've heard tonight and regret. And that's, uh, that needs to come out. And uh, I'm very excited because Analia and I are working on, you know, um, my script right now for, uh, um, you know, tentative, tentatively titled The Minority Retort. It's basically my, <laughs> my whole response to a lot of the culture and a lot of what's going on. And, you know, we're very excited because, you know, really, you know, through our sessions, I've really had to delve deep into my life. And I'm like, wow, I've never really thought about it this way. So I'm excited to read Tracy's book because I can see there's a lot of that introspection and a lot of, you know, just grappling with your faith and, and really moving forward through all of that uh, thought process and, and prayer. So I'm excited. I'll be buying your book tonight. So I'm excited. That's one. To one so. <laughs> yeah. And what's, uh, what's the name of the book again? Breaking the Perfect Ten. Yeah, so she has her table. Yeah, yeah. You can buy a book. Yeah. Uh, have her autograph and get your photo op. Yep. <laughs> and also, you know, um, Analia, it has all these wonderful shirts um, here. You can see. Uh, make sure to buy one. I I like the quality of those shirts. I've you know. I put it through the washer. I'm pretty bad to my shirts, saying, <laughs> and it's held up. So she gets you know props for picking good quality shirts. But I wanted to bring it to the audience. If uh, does anyone have any questions for our panel? I do, sir. Do I get the 
mic? Sure. Yes. Yeah. That's my friend Dan. Yeah. I, I've known him for a long time. I, um, my husband and I used to have a coffee shop back in the day. He was one of my customers. So. Okay. So, um, I'm about 60 years old, and I've started writing short stories about growing up in Orange County. And Tracy made a comment tonight about... It shouldn't be people making Christian films, but Christians making films. That's what's important. So, and they need to be real life. So, now I put my stories into two categories. One is fiction, and one is true stories, right? So, just to give you an so, so years ago, listening to Paul McGuire, he brought something to my mind. When we're kids, we run home with the stuff that we created at school, and we put it on the refrigerator, in the bathroom, on the walls. But what happens when you walk into church? The walls are bare. There's no creativity from the people in the congregation. Satan has lied to us and stolen away the creative, our creative spirit, and we become pious, or uh, we fall under piety. But just to give you an idea about the stories, they're real. I write them about childhood, and most of them I make my mom a hero because she raised five little black sheep, and we, without any help from my dad, and we gave her pure hell. But give me an idea of one of the stories. Just see, so and, and I put them all on one page. They're all on an eight and a half by 11, number 10, 11, or 12 font. And it's the idea I heard from someone in Hollywood once about sharing with the producers make sure that when you have an idea that you can put it on a matchbook. They're looking for boy meets girl, boy falls in love, girl kills boy, whatever, something like that. Keep it simple. So, one of the things when you were in Orange County, and this is, this is real people, Christians writing stuff, you could leave kids in cars, right? So my mom parked us in the Jimco parking lot and three nuns walked by. And I get, the, I'm like four or five, and I get the idea, I'm going to flip them off. So I flip these nuns off, and they come up to the car, you filthy little kids, whatever. And my sister like, yeah, get out of here, sister. We didn't know about intercoms. They go in the store, they have my mom paged. And the thing at Jemco, she'd come back with a treat and something. She comes back to the car with nothing. And I'm, and I'm like, what's wrong, what's wrong? Well, the oldest sister already knew something was wrong. She, and she goes to the side of the car behind my mom when she can't get hit. Second sister gets next to her, and I'm in the middle of the car. Oh, I'm sorry, sir. Uh, no, the question. Okay. Okay. question. Did you have a question? Yeah. <laughs> no, 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 I'm Did you have a question. Oh, okay. so I just wanted to comment on what she said. <laughs> okay. Uh, okay. okay. We have a program to run you. Okay, program. okay, okay, okay. 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 Yeah. You'll tell us how it is. Yes. Okay. So, so, yes. Uh, I thought you had a question. Any questions for, for yeah. the audience while we have this panel of experts here? Eric, please. Yes, I just wanted to know, you know, first want to thank you for being here. And second of all, I'd like to see, you know, if, if somebody's in politics, how can somebody like that help you? What the cost? Um, well, I think that they should get behind things that they are running on like for instance back to me um i'm doing a documentary on law enforcement and we have certain people in politics who say they support law enforcement yet i've been completely unable to get them to get involved because a lot of politicians are like well i'm not in the film business right mm -hmm. but it's like why not just support like there's all kinds of things that you know politicians support that aren't politics right but it's like, get behind films that have to do with the cause you're behind. Like even a film about suicide, if that's something that you're passionate about, support films. Films are amazingly powerful. And I, I, I can't remember, I think one of you were talking about it. But it's like, there is something magic. And the reason I decided to do a film where I blend faction, uh, fiction and... Um, Real life. What's, what's the, what's the fiction. other? <laughs> fact and fiction. Fact and fiction, that it is. Okay, I blend fact and fiction, but I do a little bit of storytelling in it because there's something magic about walking into a film. People will suspend their belief in reality. They will sit next to strangers, prior to COVID, um, and just let you take them on a path down a road. You know, they will suspend that belief in reality and just go with you. We'll believe that chipmunks can really sing, right? 
So that is a powerful medium, right? That's a powerful medium to get behind and support. And I think that films are becoming more like this. Like I, you know, roll them out as a politician, show up and do panels, you know, with films that you support and get engaged with the film industry. It is such a powerful medium that that's why I'm glad that Christians are getting more involved because so many Christians like yourself, like me, when I became a Christian, did the same thing. I'm like, oh, I'll just go back to college. I'm going to quit. You know, same thing. Because I felt like now I'm a Christian. I can't be in the business. We can't leave that medium to its own. We need to go be salt and light out there. And the same with politicians. Don't leave that medium to go on its own. It is such a powerful resource for all of us to, to right. make a difference. Yeah. In the and world. I think to Dan's point, you know, it's like uh, Christians have lost their creativity. I was just yeah. going to speak on that, yeah. Uh, just, God is the creator, right? We, like, look at, like, this thing, this microphone. Someone invented this. They created it. Why, why, how? Because God put within each of us the ability to be creative. Whether that's an actor telling stories, whether that's you creating the next invention to help your baby sleep at night, whether you want to go on Shark Tank and talk about how to help someone lose weight, we all have been given the ability to be creative. And tapping into that, like storytelling is just, for me, that's my passion, that's what I love to do. And right now, every single one of us who has a smartphone, hold up your phone, if you have your phone, I know it's on you, look at Dan's got it, right there. You have a little TV in your hand. You don't have to go to the theater as much anymore because COVID took that away from us for a little while. Now they're opening up again, praise the Lord. But you have a theater on your phone. Storytelling is so important. Films are so important. And I, being involved with Unplanned, I can't tell you, I've met more politicians than I have ever in my life. And just, I feel like politicians, they like especially Christian politicians that I've met, they want to get involved. They want to use their, their power to like stand up to support. I was, just before COVID hit, I was given the opportunity to go on the Senate floor in Tennessee and share my story, and then COVID came. But uh, we're gonna pray for that. Um, to be able to speak up on behalf of life, but I agree with what Tracy said. Being bold, stepping out, getting involved, um, getting behind, finding out what stories are being made in your own, like films are being filmed in your own town, um, because there's films being filmed every day, and if there are storylines, finding out what they are, getting behind them and supporting them. Um, promoting them, showing up, showing the, the film crew that you have, yeah. we have your support. And real, real quick, um, before I forget, is the blacklist real? Hollywood blacklist? I, I would say, because so. I, I have conservative, well actually like Tracy invited me last night to a, a, a conservative Hollywood networking event and on the on the little invite it said there's more of us than people really know because it's true because you know if you say you're a conservative you don't work i have like my friends who are actors on facebook they never say anything political because they want to work and it's kind of sad like I, I i'm like a big mouth <laughs> you know but i'm not afraid because god is my employer you know he's to say sustain me through covid i didn't work in the industry all last year my daughter and i work and we didn't work because of the shutdown but, you know, like I started doing, you know, making a statement about, you know, the whole shutdown and I did my shirts and God has sustained me. But, you know, he's getting me back in. And what he was saying about political, you know, my film is very political, but I see all the fighting on like Facebook and like you're not winning people over. So the way to, to get to people is through their heart and like entertainment, because that's when their defenses are down. And that's why. God had led me into film to be a messenger to reach people in a way where their defenses are down. Do you think the industry would be better if everyone were to be like you, vocal, and the people on this panel, obviously you were going to speak on the Senate floor in Tennessee, I mean that's pretty impressive. I mean if everyone were to do that, do you think that um, it wouldn't allow the people in Hollywood that are uh, liberal and left-leaning to you know, basically cancel you guys? What about just being able to agree to disagree? I'm sorry. Yeah, just, yeah, just a lost Like, yeah. I'm yeah. sorry. Like, if you want to, I'm, I'm just, I, I don't know. I remember on, years ago on Bold and Beautiful, it was um, Obama and Bush were running. I can't remember what year that was. And one of the stage managers was all Obama. I was all Bush. We would, like, listen to things. And it was like, we would, it was almost like, I'm, I'm for the Broncos and you're for the Raiders. You know, it was like that kind of a conversation that we'd have. And it was like, oh, and your team scored, you know, it was like, that was it. And it was 
fun and lighthearted and it was fine, but I'm kind of with you. I, I sort of almost wish we could go back to like my grandpa says, you don't talk about politics. It's like, yeah. it, it we're here does, to tell stories, we're not here to, you yeah, know, and it's, it's just, it what about, I think Hollywood just, they have an agenda they want me to agree with and to get with, but it's like, they want me to accept, but you also have to accept me yeah. and my views and, and what I believe. And I love life. I love family. I love children. I love uh, those kinds of things. And it's like, I should be able to feel free. I mean, we live in the land of the free, right? America, the beautiful. We should be able to boldly speak about, you know, just what we believe. And you can agree to disagree yeah, and right. we have to respect each other um, and love each other. And that's what Christ calls us to do, right? To be loving. So I love talking to people that actually disagree with me all the time because I'm like, you know what? I actually, I want to get to know you because I love you. What? But I don't agree with you. That's great. We're still going to talk. I'm still going to yeah. love you. Yeah. What if two years from now you go through a life-changing event that you actually know, hey, Sarah's pretty grounded in her faith. Let me talk to her about this Jesus thing because I'm lost. Sometimes you plant seeds. Yeah, and I think it's, you know, this is one of the things, because when I started my film, I wanted to win people over to be a conservative, and God's like, no, you know, and that's why he's, he's kind of been shaping me to say, you, I want you to win people to Christ, and he's the one that removes the veil over people's eyes, and so until they know God, they're going to be blinded by the devil. And so you can, like, fight with people until you're blue in the face. You know, it's, it's, it's fruitless. But until they know God, that's, where, that's your focus, and then he can remove the blinders, and then that's when they start seeing the truth from a lie and what the devil's doing. And, and the truth division. is nonpartisan. Yeah. yeah. But there is blacklist, there is cancel. And after I went on Larry King, I got to say, I think it was a week later I show up on set, and they're like, one of the producers takes me aside. She's like, hey, are you going to be able to do this part? And I was like, I'm sorry, what? And she goes, well, I know because you're a Christian. And, you know, there's a lot of kissing and stuff. Are you going to be able <laughs> to do this role? And I'm like, yeah, I'm going to be fine, I said. The ignorance around Christians just baffles me sometimes. But Yeah, yeah so, I mean, I was like, are, th are you going to fire me because I'm a Christian? That too, I want to speak to you. Asked earlier, how can we support you know more Christian films? Please just support Christian actors. Yeah. If we take a role on Criminal Minds and we're the bad guy, we're not the bad guy in real life. You know, we're acting. Um, sometimes God leads us to to be a part of projects that you. I don't know. Just for me, sometimes I would get judgmental Christians that would say, oh, oh, be careful, don't do that role because uh, you're going to end up following Satan. Well, how do you know that Jesus didn't tell me that I should go be on that, that do that role because I'm going to talk to the gaffer on that set and he doesn't know Christ and his wife has cancer and I need to pray for him. How do you know that? So just be supportive of us. I'm so glad you said that because that is true and I've dealt with the same thing. Like I was so excited when my my book came out. I was doing all these interviews with Christian radio and I'd get callers like, so you modeled lingerie in the past, and I'm like, yeah, I did. And you call your, you're on a soap opera, and you call yourself a Christian? How? And I'm like, um. And you're the villain. Your character is pretty villainous, right? And, I played uh, a villain. Yeah. No, on Sunset Beach, I was a villain. On One Life, to, but you know what? God's been so good to me. I have not had a single love scene on three different soap operas. What? Yes. I was the evil nanny Tess. I had one, I've kissed, that's it. And then on the second one, I was on One Life to Live. I played like, um, like we were just politically married. He was the governor. And it was just kind of a cold relationship, so we didn't have a lot of affection. And then the third one, I'm married to a guy who has AIDS. And so, yeah. Yeah. Worked out. Worked out. I'm not for him. Real quick, for him. I'm going to say, when I came back into acting, I was like, okay, Jesus, yes, I'm going to be the mom. I'm going to be this, like the cookie cutter Christian stuff. Literally, I've played an abortion worker, a drug addict, uh, some suicidal. Like, the, the Lord's like, no, you're going to go to the trenches. We're going to tell these ugly, gritty stories. So just support You have us. the spunk, so I, I see why you get cast in those roles. I My next it. one, the That's suicide film, She's. I'm going to be pretty I mean. I can't wait to watch it. I'm very excited. I mean, Mom. Let's take one final question, and then we can wrap up. Peter, and just so you know, Peter's with Chinese American Volunteers Association, and he's really helped us out today. And a fantastic drummer. Thank you. <laughs> well, um, first of all, thank all of you guys. Uh, it's such an amazing testimony that I got to hear from you guys. Um, it's so touching. 
So, like Mark said, I'm part of Chinese American Volunteers Association. So we have a lot of high school students um, that are participating in community service and all of that, which is great. However, you know, living in a society today, it's so quote unquote like open yeah. society. You know, kids our age in high school, they're already doing what they're not supposed to be doing. And they're thinking that um, there's always like a, you know, like a fail safe, right? Like abortion and, you know, Planned Parenthood and all these horrible things. So what's your message, direct message for these high schoolers to tell them that, hey, you know, there is no way out of this. You know, this is not right. And you guys need to, you know, fix your crooked path. The devil is a liar. Amen. You know, um, and if you're a parent, you need to be praying for your kids. And um, I, I hate being the mean parent that's strict. I thought my parents were strict, but um, in this day and age with technology and phones and the internet, kids have so much accessibility to garbage and you have to keep, you know, be the mean parent, you know, because there's so much trash out there. Um, give them um, other opportunities to do something fruitful, productive, creative, like creativity. You know, I, you know, I, you know, just give them something, an alternative to spend their time bearing fruit. Find what their gifts are and give them that time. Cause like kids who are glued to their phone, it's just, it's garbage. Um, and the devil is just getting into everything and you really, it, and it's hard, you know, because um, you're, you're fighting society and, the, you know, just every angle the devil can get at your kids, he will. But pray for your kids, know what they're doing. And then with the kids, get them creative. Like music is a great outlet, you know, just, you know, my, my daughter's very artistic, you know, get him to read. Um, yeah, I, you know, I kind of taken the phone from my daughter and I said, okay, you're gonna go back to reading books, <laughs> you know? Um, and then like shows, like we love Little House on the Prairie. Like I didn't realize like what a great show that was until I bought the DVDs for her. And I didn't realize it was a Christian TV show. And we just started watching it again and, she, and she's just weepy. She's like, oh, it's so sweet. And I'm like, yes, because she was watching other garbage on Netflix. And I'm like, no, no more Netflix. Um, and so I'm glad that she loves that, but you gotta keep their minds and their hearts pure because it's, yeah. And, and if you don't, like, whoever gets to your child first has them. And that's what the, why the devil is getting them younger and but younger you know, and younger. But less about parenting, why, you know, I think Peter was asking directly yeah. what you would say to the kids. I would say there's a large difference between pleasure and joy. And Kids these days are seeking pleasure and it's temporary and it's guilty pleasure. And there's a huge difference between guilty pleasure and true joy. And the devil will tell you, you know, the devil's like drinking salt water. You'll always be thirsty, you know, and have them seek true joy. Guilt-free joy is better than pleasure. So it's kind of like a diet of all ice cream or having a substantial steak meal, right? Yes, followed by a little bit of ice cream is okay. Yeah, not, gonna, not here to say no Fruit ice cream. Yeah. Fruit. In moderation. I feel in my gut to share with you, don't be afraid to go against the grain. So I think, I remember being in high school, um, and just even not in high school, even just in Hollywood and having conversations with friends and feeling peer pressure to go with what everyone else is saying, but inside me I knew something was wrong and that I didn't agree with that. And if you feel God is leading you to stand up for truth, if, if you're in a group of friends and they're like, oh yeah, well, Planned Parenthood's cool, and then you're just like, well, I don't agree with that, and I want, don't be afraid to stand out. Don't be afraid to stand up and to say what's right. Um, God put you there for a reason, and there's nothing wrong with you, you're not weird, even I, I believe First Peter, Second Peter talks about that, like the world looks at us like we're weird, like, you don't agree with us? Like, what do you mean? That's normal. That's, a, that's actually normal for a Christian. And so, like, just if I was in high school again, I would love to be the person that would stand out more and not be afraid to speak up for what's right. And I, I, I think that was very powerful. And I think, Sarah, you just have this uh, ability and personality, I think, to really influence a lot of young people. So whatever you can do, you know, I, I'd love to get you out there to speak to the youth. You know, I will say, unplanned, it really it, it really hit me, the rhetoric um, that comes from Planned Parenthood. 
Planned Parenthood. I, to prep for this film, I didn't have the script, I didn't finish reading the movie until I was on my plane ride over to film the movie. It was so hush-hush, they didn't give us a script right away. It was very protected, we filmed under a different uh, name, everything. Wow. But my acting coach that I worked with in prep, to prep for it, he was like, well, you don't have the script, you know what you gotta do, right? And I said, no, I don't wanna do it, I think I know, but no. And he goes, you gotta go visit a Planned Parenthood. So I actually visited two. Um, one in Burbank, and then actually I visited another one out in where was I? Where where's uh, Notre Dame? Is that uh, Indiana? Indiana. There we go. Um, but I visited a Planned Parenthood before, and my experience was really it was really dark. Um, it was very impersonal. Like what if I was going in to abort my child? Like it was very dark. There was no one there to really greet me. It was behind a bulletproof glass. Like I just it was very impersonal and dark. And then. Um, they offered to give me pamphlets because I, I I actually pretended, I was like, oh, I'm doing an acting class and I'm, I'm portraying in my scene uh, a nurse. And so I just thought I'd come in here, you know, because have you ever heard of method acting? And they were like, um, no. And I was like, well, you know, we just really come from a real place. You know, we behave truthfully under imaginary circumstances, blah, blah, blah. Like I was explaining the whole thing. She's like, well, do you want to shadow one of us? And I was like, can I do that? She goes, no. And I was like, well, why did you mention it? I was like, yes, I'll take me to the POC. I'm taking it to the back. I want to know what I'm doing. So that way, when I was on set, I, it felt normal. I wanted to see what it was like. But every pamphlet I got, what really stuck out to me was just the rhetoric, just the wording. And so with what you said about your kids, speak truth to one another. Be, call things for what they are. Yes. Speak. Don't shelter. No. Be truthful. And, and see the world. they're going to word things differently. Like Planned Parenthood tells young women that make mistakes, yeah, you did make a mistake and you can't do it. Oh yeah, no, we're here to help you. No, you're here to tell me I can't. Speak truth to one another and, and just call rhetoric for what it is. We need to start changing the wording and, and speaking right. truthfully, do you know what I mean? And, yeah. and, and putting hope into people. So if you have a friend in high school that does have an unplanned pregnancy, go up to that person and encourage them. Tell them they're doing a good job, yeah. that they got this, that you're there for them, support them. Because they need to hear that because they're not, they might not be getting it from home because that's what the world is telling them that they can't do it, right. you know? So, I don't know. Yeah, I'm more, I'm I'm more about, down. you know, because uh, I think eventually all your kids are going to see the world. You might as well be there to guide them and not try to change and manipulate that world because that will make them more interested like the cookie jar. Don't touch that cookie jar. Well, no, no, no. My thing is like, you want to be the first person to tell them about it. Rather than Sometimes them. it can't be that yeah, first yeah. person. Yeah. You cannot control that. I'm glad that you are though. Yeah. I'm Atlanta. Yeah. <laughs> not everyone has that. Love my mom. She was there, but like we didn't have any kind I of I have talk. a 20 year old. Uh, teenage years are <laughs> rough. Yeah. They're rough, and I am grateful that there's people like you out there trying to help these teens. So yeah. thank you for what and you're politicians. Doing. You. I'm not sure yeah. if you're a politician. Yeah, but uh, actually, great. Eric is our mayor, um, uh, incoming mayor of this city, yeah. Walnut. Yeah. Uh, yeah, sure. And I was just going to bring you up and ask, actually Pastor Terry as well and Pastor Joseph to kind of just close this out in prayer. Uh, no, let's, uh, let's all be up here for them. Yeah. So you wanted to say something? Just real quick. Yeah. You know, I was the worst Christian you can imagine for 15 years. 2017, my wife died. And then since then, I've seen 24 people die. Tomorrow, I'm doing a sea scattering for my mom. So during this whole process, I realized there's only one God. He woke me up. Because I was the worst one sitting in the corner. I didn't want to listen. Hey, finish. Hurry up, Pastor. I want to go shopping. I want to go eat. But he said, hey, would you wake up? Boom. Oh so I lost six family members. But because of that, uh, I, I, you know, I can, you know, I have an incredible story. You know, this guy saw a few things. And then Pastor Terry as well. And I'm here. I'm determined to get into a higher office to solve this problem for him, not for me. That's why I ask you, when I get to the Congress House of Representatives, yeah. this is one issue I will be champion of. Support film, support Christian film. Oh, we're gonna, and we want to support you. Yeah, how, you want to support, how can we support you? Yeah. I'm running next year because this is one issue very true to me. And then we're killing 60 million kids, babies. What are we doing? Right? You want to bang gun? Hey, how many people? You know, we're we're trying guys to 
designed to protect good people. But abortion, every single one is designed to kill. I love what Abby Johnson says. She says, our goal isn't to make abortion illegal. Our goal is to make abortion unthinkable. So when I say we need to speak truth to especially our youth, because um, social media, everything's targeted at our youth. And think about it. That's our next generation of leaders, our youth. So we need to be speaking like you, sir. Thank you so much for being willing to stand in the gap. And I believe the Lord is with you. And I believe the Lord is going to send his angel armies to protect you because you are in his mission field, standing up for truth, standing up for what's right, and fighting for truth. When I get there, I'm going to invite you to the White House, to the to the Capitol Hill, and uh, testify. Amen. 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 We want to support you and your Thank you very much. Great. Thank you so much. And, you know, I really want to thank uh, Pastor Terry, who is a man I've known for years and who's so brave to start this ministry here with Ken too and to uh, embark on his journey as a leader. So I really wanted uh, Pastor Terry and Pastor Joseph uh, to also come up. I'll give you my mic to uh, end this uh, evening in prayer. Yes, today is so special. It's, I mean, it's a new beginning for us who live here in Walnut that uh, we get to see what God wants to do through different spheres, uh, through film, through politics, and through books, and through us, through different ways. And this is a time where we, as Christians, we should rise up and we should be the voice of God in all different ways we could. And I see that tonight, it's a, just a, I, I feel so excited about what's going to come Amen. after this. And, and I just I congratulate to all of you who show up tonight because you are in something that is so beautiful and so precious and so powerful. We just want to pray for all our people here, that uh, also for, for Mark, that God will bless them in everything they put their hands on. We want to see that uh, they will truly be used by God in all different ways, just to promote the kingdom and to really let the whole world know who is our king. So thank you, Jesus. Father, we love you. We thank you. And uh, we just honor you, Lord. We thank you for everything you've done for us, Lord. You're, in John 3, 16, you said you, you so loved the world that you gave your only begotten Son. Whosoever believes in him will not perish, but have everlasting life. Lord. And uh, so we just thank you. Thank you for such a special night, Lord God, with, with the testimonies that were shared here and, and with the film. Lord God, um, scripture that comes to mind, Lord, is that, that we overcame by the blood of the Lamb, by the power of our testimony, Lord. And, and it's just a special night, Lord. So we thank you. Um, we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 All right, guys. Thank you for coming to you. Bless you. See you next time. And guys, don't forget, uh, buy some shirts, buy some books, and uh, I'm going to be shopping right now. Thanks.